From drinking gladiator blood to lobotomies, humanity's quest for cures has led us down some dark, twisted paths. You're unlikely to know about the ones we'll cover. In ancient Rome, the Colosseum was the go-to spot for brutal combat and public spectacle. Gladiators clashed in fierce battles, their struggles a form of entertainment for the eager crowd. Amidst the violence, a peculiar belief took hold that the blood of a gladiator had healing powers. We'll just let modern medical systems take notes for a moment, okay? Romans believed that this blood could cure various ailments, from infertility to weakness. In a society fixated on vitality, the idea of seeking life from the throes of death was oddly fitting. Spectators would scramble to collect the spilled blood. Spilled blood, convinced it would rejuvenate them. As gladiators fought and bled, their blood was seen as a remedy and a chance to absorb their strength and courage. But let's consider the desperation that led to such practices. However, as time progressed, the popularity of gladiator fights declined, and with it, the practice of drinking their blood. The empire crumbled, and this once common belief faded into obscurity. So much for that miracle cure. Are there modern examples of people drinking the blood of others? Aside from occultists, there is one example of a Japanese man who would drink donated blood in order to survive, on account of his unique medical condition. At least this blood was donated willingly. The brain matter in our next medical practice probably wasn't. I'm going to puncture your skull with this spike, relax bro, were likely some common last words, or some variant of these. Trepanation was an ancient practice that spanned from Egypt to pre-Columbian America. The process was as gruesome as it sounds, cutting or drilling into the skull, aiming to cure ailments or kick out evil spirits. And guess what? Archaeological finds show signs of healing, meaning folks often survived this primitive brain surgery. But let's not sugarcoat it. This was risky stuff, just a whole lot of hope and probably a fair bit of screaming. No sterilization and often no anesthesia, beyond alcohol in later years, or being knocked out by a firm punch from your surgeon if you lived in ancient Greece. Why go through such an ordeal? Simple. People were desperate for solutions, and when you're desperate, you take risks. It's a raw, unfiltered look at our relentless pursuit of well-being. Interestingly, the extreme and counterintuitive nature of this practice is matched by the next, the rack. In a strange turn of fate, the rack, originally designed as a torture instrument, found itself repurposed with the noble intention of stretching out a body to fix its deformities. How? Well, it's complicated. But first, let's understand the rack. Imagine being strapped down, limbs tethered to rollers at either end. Slowly, agonizingly, the rollers are turned pulling your body in opposite directions, your joints creak, your muscles strain, and then pop. Dislocation at its finest. The pain is unbearable, and yet it continues. In some cases, bones would break, the tendons sometimes elongating over such a long period that bones would break instead. The popular show Mythbusters put this to the test and found it to be true. This medieval monstrosity wasn't just a fixture in dank, dark dungeons. It made appearances in historical settings that would make your skin crawl. The Tower of London, check. The Spanish Inquisition, check. Rack wasn't just about physical pain. It was a psychological nightmare, leaving victims permanently damaged. How did it come to be used in medicine? Experimentation. Over time, it was believed that with careful usage, the rack was believed to have therapeutic benefits. The idea was that by gradually stretching the body, spinal deformities and misalignments could be corrected. It is somewhat comparable to a modern inversion table, something that many people have in their homes. Physicians of the time thought that a good stretch could alleviate back pain, realign the spine and even improve one's posture. However, not everything has a positive side or a modern adaptation, least of all our next entry. The once revered universal cure, 
one so lethal that 2.5 grams is enough to kill an adult. Mercury. From ancient China, where it was believed to grant immortality, to the salons of 19th century Europe, this shimmering liquid metal was hailed as a miracle remedy. Physicians prescribed mercury in various forms, ointments, pills, and even steam baths, where patients would inhale mercury vapors. Chief among the feared ailments was syphilis, a treacherous disease that starts with innocent-looking sores, but stealthily progresses to rash, fever, and eventually debilitating organ damage, which was the bane of many. In their desperation, many people turned to mercury as a miracle cure, many preaching its potency. Oh, how wrong they were. Mercury, you see, is toxic, very toxic. It insidiously attacks the human body, causing everything from kidney failure to neurological damage. But that didn't stop historical figures like the Chinese emperor Qin Shi Huang or the renowned alchemist Isaac Newton from using it in pursuit of health and, no and knowledge. The belief in its efficacy was so widespread that it became almost fashionable. But as time marched on, the grim reality of mercury's toxic effects became undeniable. The once praised cure-all was found to also cause tremors, mood swings, and ultimately death. The search for safer treatments began, and mercury was ousted from its pedestal of medical marvels. In the wake of mercury's fall from grace, the early 20th century saw the rise of a new miracle cure, one that promised to invigorate and rejuvenate, Radithor. This health tonic, infused with the mysterious power of radioactivity, was marketed as nothing short of a panacea. It was the energy drink of its day, and people were lapping it up, quite literally. Radithor was essentially radium dissolved in water. Yes, you heard that right, radium, in water, and people drank it. Hailed as a perpetual sunshine, its advocates claimed it could cure everything from impotence to arthritis. But, as you might expect, the glow didn't last long. The tragic tale of Eben Byers, a wealthy industrialist and socialite, eliminated much of the glow that had surrounded Radithor. Byers was a devout believer in Radithor's powers, consuming it religiously until his jaw literally fell off. Radiation poisoning claimed its poster boy, leading to a slow, agonizing death that involved organ failure and unimaginable pain. The lack of regulation and understanding of radioactivity at the time allowed such horrors to unfold. It was a wild west of medical quackery, where anything could be bottled and sold. But eventually, the grim reality surfaced and the dangers of Radithor and its ilk were exposed. Let's finish with something truly bizarre, malaria therapy. In the early 20th century, the medical community was grappling with syphilis, a devastating and widespread disease. This desperation for a cure led to this peculiar and audacious treatment. The rationale behind this seemingly counterintuitive approach was grounded in the understanding of fevers. Physicians observed that patients who had bouts of high fever sometimes experienced a reduction in syphilis symptoms. This observation wasn't baseless. The syphilis-causing bacteria, Treponema pallidum, is highly sensitive to temperature and could be weakened or killed by the elevated body temperatures induced by fever. Enter malaria, a disease well known for causing intense fevers. Dr. Julius Wagner Jureg, an Austrian psychiatrist, hypothesized that intentionally infecting syphilis patients with malaria would induce fevers high enough to combat the syphilis bacteria. It was a calculated risk, using the body's natural response to one infection as a weapon against another. Wagner Joreg's experiments showed some success, and he even won the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1927 for his work. However, the treatment was a double-edged sword. While the induced malaria did lead to fever, that could kill the syphilis bacteria, it also brought along the severe and potentially fatal symptoms 
of malaria itself. In essence, doctors were playing a high-stakes game, hoping that the malaria could be controlled and cured after it had done its job against syphilis.